on September 27, 1735. Robert Robinson was born in Norfolk, England. As a child, he experienced tragedy because his father passed away while he was still a young child. Robinson was a very intelligent young man and there was a desire and passion for him to pursue the clergy career at some point. But because of the death of his father, those plans were altered. His mother not able to keep up with the family because the social safety net in the 18th century in England was not as strong as it is today. So the mother sent him to London to apprentice as a barber so that he can work and take care of himself and also support the family. Robinson gets into London and started developing a character of rebellion. Why? Because, you know, a, a guy from a small town being exposed into a bigger city life. Robinson lived in London without the guidance of his family, found himself drawn to bad companies. And he became associated with the gang of the hoodlums and indulge in various gun related activities. Living the gun life is not about wondering if you will find trouble, but about knowing it's only a matter of time when you will find that trouble. So Robinson's life as a child would desire to be a clergy. Now he was on the pathway you can call it to destruction. It was at this critical time in Robinson's life that he heard about a preacher called George Whitefield. He was one of the greatest evangelists of that time. And he decided together with his gang friends to go to a place where George Whitefield was preaching, to do two things, to make mockery of him and to pity his audience. He went in, sat down, and he was hunted by the message that George Whitefield preached. Whitefield preached in Matthew chapter 3, verse 7. Oh, generation of vipers, why are you running away from the wrath to come? Whitefield was hunted by it. The sermon profoundly resonated with Robinson, leading to a spiritual awakening that changed the direction of his life. It ended the face of his life that was a rebellious to a face of conversion and ministry. And at age 23, when he was converted, he penned these beautiful words in this hymn.
term fount is old British English. We don't use it anymore in our modern language. But the word fount is sometimes used metaphorically to denote intangible ideas or concepts like knowledge, wisdom. So to Robinson, God is the source, the origin of all blessings. Amen. Come down fount of every blessing. He talks about God should tune his heart to sin his grace. He's asking for the divine assistance to be able to develop a heart that is of gratitude. To really appreciate what God has done for him. Come down fount of every blessing. These words that was written by Robert Robinson reflect his inability to cease from singing God's grace. The realization that it is only the power of God in his life that has completely changed and transformed his life. Knowing where he was headed, knowing the path he was, the gang life, and God came to his rescue and completely changed him. You can clearly see that he cannot hide the gratitude, the thankfulness. Friends, some of these words in the hymns were personal to the writers. They were not just singing for money. It was their personal life experience. Here I raise my stanza of the hymn Robert Robinson referenced the book of first Samuel chapter 7 verse 12 where the Bible says then Samuel took a stone and set it up between Mizpah and Shem and called its name Ebenezer saying thus far the Lord has helped us Amen. before this story 20 years ago Israel has engaged in the battle with the Philistines. The Bible says the Philistines defeated Israel. 4,000 of Hebrew men were killed that day. Israel retreated from the battlefield. And when they retreated, because they were not right with God, because they are forsaken God, the elders of Israel gathered to understand what has just happened to us? They decided to send someone to Shiloh to fetch the ark of God from Shiloh. Why? Because they know that wherever the ark of God has been with them, victory has attended Israel. So they wanted to go to the, go with the second wave of the battle. But this time, they wanted to, if God is not going to come, they will force God on the battlefield. So they sent someone to Shiloh and the Ark of the Covenant came to camp. 
Baron, Hophni, and Phinehas, and they were ready for the second phase of the battle. They were so confident. Why? Because wherever the ark of God has been, victory has attended Israel. When the Jericho wall came down, without explosion, without a ladder, the ark of God was there. When the sun stood still, and Joshua and his army decimated the Amorite, the ark of God was there. And when Jordan rose back, and Israel walked on the dry land to claim the promised land. The ark of God was there. So they were so sure that this time, if they go into the battlefield, if the ark will be there, they will be victorious. But friends, what happened that day, Israel was defeated again. But this time, it's not just 4,000, 30,000 of Hebrew men were killed. The two sons of the priest died. The Ark of the Covenant was captured. And 20 years later, Samuel came to them and says, If you will return to the Lord with all your heart and get away all your gods, the Baals and the Asherah, if you return, God will be with you. And we are told, friends, that the children of Israel put away all their gods and they served God on. Amen. And Samuel gathered them and said, let us come, let us worship, let us pray to our God. There was great revival happening in the land. But while they were gathering, the Philistines thought they were gathering for battle. They weren't gathering for battle. They were gathering to serve their God. They were gathering to worship their God. So the Bible says the children of Israel said to Samuel, Now, the Philistines are on the way because they are ready for the third way. Israel just gathered to just pray and serve God. But this time, instead of devising their own plan, they go to Samuel and says, You have to pray to God for us. You have to seek God for us. Do not cease to cry out to the Lord, our God, for us, that he may save us from the hands of the Philistines. And look at what happened. And Samuel took a suckling lamp and offered it as a whole burnt offering to the Lord. Then Samuel cried out to the Lord for Israel, and the Lord answered him. And the Bible says, now as Samuel was offering up the lamb's offering, the Philistines drew near to battle against Israel. And the Bible says, but the Lord tended with a great tender upon the Philistines that day and confused them and they were overcame. You have to see what is happening. The first, second battle they went in with swords and arrows with their own devices. The second battle, Israel has just gathered to worship and praise God. And while the lamp was on the altar, while the smoke went up to the Lord, while the offering was accepted, God tended. And Israel, the Philistines, were confused and defeated. And Samuel says, look, this, is, this, this victory, there is nobody in the Hebrew camp that will think that it was by their own strength. Are you guys with me? Yes. Because they were just worshipping. I don't even know even someone is holding a slingshot. This victory was so decisive that it was God who did it. Amen. And Samuel said, I know how you, as human, you forgot a lot. I want to memorize, I want to commemorate this victory by pitching a stone. And with that stone, I will write Ebenezer on it. Samuel wanted some physical, something physical to show what 
God has just done. They could have just talked about it and moved forward. No. He wanted to show something physical about this victory. And he erected that. And why is this important? Why is it that getting to the end of the year, we should just sit, pause, and reflect? The reason is that as humans, we are really good at one thing. You know what that is? Forgetfulness. You know, a German psychologist named Hermann Ebenhaus, he studied what we call memory and um, discovered how it's called the forgetting curve. The forgetting curve is how we retain stuff as people. And it last week that memory retention decreased over time with an, with an exponential manner. So when you listen to the sermon I'm preaching right now, an hour after this sermon, you are going to lose about 56% of what I just talked about. Don't worry, I'm not going to judge you about that. <laughs> about a day, 77% will be gone. And of course, it just tapered down after a week, and we just only re retain only 25% of it. This is us. We forget very easily. I can tell you, I have a list. I go to Costco. And I still miss stuff that is on the list. <laughs> I don't know whether I'm the only one, but sometimes I have it on the list item. But sometimes I forget what is. We are human beings. We forget very easily. So Samuel says, you cannot forget what God has done. I need to raise this Ebenezer stone. So that any time you walk and pass by, you remember this day where God gave you that decisive victory over your enemy. Amen. There's a saying that, why do I always forget where I put my keys, yet I never forget a grudge? And one also say, some days I'm amazed myself, other days, I look for my phone while I'm holding it. Yes. We forget. And that is why period like this, time like this, where we pause and reflect, where we pause and look back, take a stock, what God has done for us, it's so critical. So, Samuel pitch the stone, says, I don't want any of you to forget what God did this day for you as Israel. I'm bringing the message to a cross. What lessons can we learn? Lesson number one, Ebenezer, that stone, the erection of that Ebenezer reminded the Jews the, for both their current victory and their past defeat. What does that mean? The same place that they were standing jubilating that day, Samuel wanted them to remember not just the victory, but the failure that happened 20 years ago. Sometimes we can have more reason to thank God when we reflect on times where we went on our own strength and used our own power and used our own genius and plans and everything and failed and God came in and rescued us and when we see our failures, we appreciate more. That is not me and God. This is, yeah, this is God. And without God, without him, the victory wouldn't have come. So Ebenezer, that stones, reminds them not just their victory, but the failure. Uh, so it teaches the importance of remembering our past mistake, not just for the sake of regret, but to appreciate the mercy and the hope that we have received from the Lord. Chaspersian says, I call to remembrance all my failures as I stand on this hill of joy. Ebenezer should 
remind us that was it not God, those victories wouldn't have come. Lesson number two, I want you to take away. The victory that was achieved was because of the lamp. While the lamp was on that altar and the smoke ascended, God took care of their enemies. Every victory won, every success achieved in this building, and every success that will be achieved in this building is by one person and one person alone, and that is the person of Christ Jesus. Amen. The reason for the success is because of the lamp. Yes. Friends, the lamp of God is the reason the victory was obtained. Yes. The lamp of God. And the Lord says this, which is so powerful, that the bread we eat is the purchase of his broken body. The water we drink is bought by his spilled blood. Never one, saints or sinners, Never one, saint or sinner, eat his daily food, but he is nourished by the body and the blood of Christ. The cross of Calvary is stamped on every loaf. There are people who don't believe in Jesus, but they are alive because of him. Every victory, every success, every blessing is because of the Lamb. You know, there are 12 months, 52 weeks, 365 days, and the number goes on. We breathe averagely 16 breaths within a minute. Average. So we are talking about 8.4 something million breaths a year. Listen to this. Every breath you take is by the grace of God. Yes. And we need to appreciate that. Yes. The last point I wanted to make is that Ebenezer depicts the idea that God has indeed helped us. Not anybody. When they won that victory, it's not because someone was smart within the group. It's not because the elders came up with an ingenious plan. When they won that battle, it was clear and decisive. It was because the Lord has helped them. Yeah. And our journey this year can only be attributed to the grace and the help of God. Amen. So as we go through 2023, 2024, I should say, 23 is done. The event of this year brought us closer home. And the closer home, friends, I mean closer home because Jesus is coming again. Yes. And until then, maybe we'll sing the last stanza of the hymn. Until then, let's sing the last stanza of the hymn. Until then, we need to hold on, friends. We need to hold on. Yes. Yes. The devil will come to us to cause us to waver, to wander away. We need to hold on. Yes. Until then, we should all hope that God will keep us and move us closer, closer home. <laughs>